chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3, as we get into the second of part 2, if you will, of our meditation on unity, good days, and loving life. We'll be rereading verses 8 through 12 of chapter 3, but before we do that, let us boldly approach the throne of grace, which we can do because of Christ our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your word, living and active and abiding forever, that living word which is sharper than any two-edged sword, that living word which transforms and conforms us to Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. Father, as we endeavor to delve into your word, once again, we humbly pray as your sheep that you give us eyes that see your word, ears that hear your word, and a heart and a mind that understand and engrave your word upon it. Heavenly Father, we pray not just that, but that you give us a desire and a fire and an inclination to move forward in obedience that we may be doers of your word and not simply hearers. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. And so we got last week to seeing what could almost have been titled in, in our sermon series, Biblical Submission, the Church. Peter saying in verses 8 through 12, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not pay, repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing for... Whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And so we meditated on these truths, these characteristics of Christians abiding and dwelling in unity. Those characteristics which serve as a witness and a testimony to the world at large. Just as our marriage is a witness and a testimony of the husband and bridal relationship of Christ and His church, so is our interactions with one another to be of such a caliber that the world looking in may see what the Word of God describes as good, what the Word of God calls for Christians to have. And we meditated on what it meant to have a unity of mind and how that means that we can have eschatological differences because we are united in the fundamentals and how we are to be sympathetic, sympathetic with one another, bearing one another's burdens, rejoicing with one another. And we are to have a brotherly love, a familial and filial love that comes from a tender heart. If you remember that, that, that intestinal, visceral kind of love that is tender and a mind that is humble. Our interactions and actions towards one another are loving and familial and humble, sympathetic and united. These are the characteristics that we are to have within the body of believers and the 
if you want to think about it this way, these are the testing grounds. These are our training grounds. We have the opportunity to be able to demonstrate unity and sympathy and brotherly love and tenderheartedness in an environment with like-minded and redeemed brothers and sisters. We are practicing with one another patience. If we think about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, God, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. We demonstrate these things in what is supposed to be the easiest environment with other brothers and sisters in Christ so that when we are outside in the world, we have an easier time representing Christ to the world. And so Peter moved on saying, Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. And we spoke about how it is that we are to be like Christ. How we respond, how we endure hardships and reviling is supposed to be Christ-like. We demonstrate Christ-like character. When Christ was spat, when Christ was hurt, we, we read in our reading this week how, in Isaiah, how he had no beauty to behold. And we're talking about in his sufferings. We, we don't often stop and think about the, the physical, the physiological elements of the crucifixion and what that actually meant. No one then and there looking at Christ physically could have said, what a beautiful man. Rather, his flesh was torn. His flesh was pierced. He suffered extreme torture. His body was swollen in various places. If we stop and we analyze, which we have now, of the ability to analyze scientifically what some of those the, the torturous elements of the, the cross would have been, we can see how there was no beauty there. But even in those moments, there was nothing but faithfulness. We went over the seven sayings of Christ on the cross and how it is that they are supposed to motivate us to better and more faithfully represent Christ in this world because He set the bar. He set the bar in perfect and absolute obedience and we strive after that obedience. We recognize we'll not be able to perfectly exemplify Christ-like character and Christ-like obedience and Christ-like love and Christ-like charity and Christ-like disposition when we encounter hostility. But when scorned, we do not respond with scorn because Christ showed us that. When we are hated upon, we do not respond with hate. We are Christians and we don't respond in a tit-for-tat kind of way. Rather, we respond counterculturally to revilings. And it is a matter of sanctification. Men can be quick-tempered. We can be easy to insult. We've, we've often, for example, and not, not an example of the temperament, but of defensiveness, heard Pastor Aaron say, if anyone wants to mess with my wife, they'll have to go through me. And so we, we see that there are complexities that I'm sure every husband, every Christian husband, would say the same. If anyone wants to get at my wife, they all have to go through me. There are complexities within that, just as there are biblical complexities and, and, and instructions on how we respond to a worldly government, how we respond to worldly husbands and wives, how we respond submissively there and yet always in obedience to the Lord. Likewise, there is a genuine sense in which we don't repay evil for evil. We don't repay reviling for reviling. But on the contrary, we respond in prayer. We respond by saying, we will pray for you. We respond by asking the Lord to forgive them. Again, if you remember that story that Dr. MacArthur had said, where that soldier was beat up by his superior. 
because he couldn't do his work right. And his superior found his boots perfectly shined up the next morning and inquired as to who did that. And it was the man whom he'd beaten the day before. And he goes to the man and he says, why would you do that? And he said, because God has told me to love you even when you hate me. And that, that is, of course, a, a rather hardcore example. But there are many, many, many examples like that in Christian history. I've spoken about the, the, the lady over in Turkey whose husband was killed for professing Christ. And she was put on their nation, national TV stating to the people that brutalized and murdered her husband, I forgive you. Christ has called me to forgive you and I will do so. I do not hold you in hate and in derision. And that was extremely countercultural within the Turkish culture, which is very much, you hurt me, I hurt you back. You hurt me, I hurt you harder. And so this woman coming and saying, I forgive you for the brutal murder of my husband because that is what Christ has called me to, shook the people there and it was an absolute witness. And what is the reason why we can do that? Because we understand vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. No one will escape his judgment. We are representatives of Christ. So we bless those that hate us. We pray for their salvation rather than taking the vengeance upon ourselves. And it is absolutely difficult. We stop and we think of the various seriously difficult situations that we have to counsel new Christians as regards this forgiveness. We touched on this last week. It's a part of the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us, right? And we understand that, that the Lord has said, if you do not forgive, you are not forgiven. It is a clear, concrete, and absolute statement. And so when we talk, and I've had the, the experience of having a counsel, people in this kind of situation, men and women who were brutally, viciously abused as children, and come to Christ... And the first thing you hear from them is, I can't forgive them. I cannot forgive them for how much they did to me, for all of the years of horribleness that I endured. And, 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 and there are some that say, you just simply do not understand, and this is a quotation, the quote-unquote hell that I have been through. How could I possibly forgive that? To which I respond with, because you are called to. Because Christ, your Savior, the one who forgave countless transgressions of yours, has said, forgive them. They won't escape my judgment. It is exceedingly difficult for us to live this out. To not repay evil for evil, reviling for reviling. You imagine yourself as a homeowner or a shop owner or even a car owner and someone comes and takes a bat to your property or to your business or to your car. Why? Because you have a sticker in the back that says, I love my church or I love Jesus. Or simply a sticker that says, repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you parked at Walmart and you walked out and you see a group of hoodlums beating down on your car and destroying them. What is your response? Obviously call the police, right? But what is your personal response? What is scripture calling you to do? Do not repay evil for evil. Hey, I know that kid. That kid drives a moped. Well, just wait, see what I can do to his moped with my pickup. No, that's not, that's not our response. We have to swallow, if you will, temper, bridle our anger and our frustration and instead be the faithful representatives and ambassadors of Jesus Christ. John Calvin comments saying, in these words, every kind of revenge is forbidden. For in order to preserve love, we must bear with many things. At the same time, he does not speak here of mutual benevolence, but he would have us to endure wrongs when provoked by ungodly men. 
And though it is commonly thought that it is an instance of a weak and abject mind, not to avenge injuries, yet it is counted before God as the highest magnanimity. Nor is it indeed enough to abstain from revenge, but Peter requires also that we should pray for those who reproach us. For to bless here means to pray, as it is set in opposition to the second clause. But Peter teaches us in general that evils are to be overcome by acts of kindness. Again, when we think about that, that, that Christian, he's saying an attitude of gratitude. Well, that, that, that is an attitude which demonstrates the gratitude we have for the salvation that Christ has given us. And I'm not telling you guys that even I myself would be able to perfectly handle the situation that I just talked about. Walking out and seeing a bunch of people beaten up on my car and being able to say, Lord, forgive them, save them, that there's going to be a serious moment or a serious couple of days, depending on the gravity of the situation, where I will have to take it to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, I'm seriously struggling here. This is the only mode of transportation I've had, and now it's been destroyed by these unbelievers. But your word, but your word calls me to pray for them to pray that you save the people that just did this evil against me. We are not called to be the avengers of evil. We are not called to take vengeance upon ourselves for any and all slights. I really like the way that John Calvin said, in these words, every kind of revenge is forbidden. Every kind. Verbal, emotional, sociological, we are not calling, for example, the cops so that the cops can be the instrument of our vengeance. Rather, as Scripture states, we call the police because they are the magistrate of the Lord who wield the sword to punish evil. It always goes back to our heartful disposition. Martin Luther likewise comments that our disposition is a Christocentric one, a christ like one, a Christ center one. He says, see, God has shown you his favor and has taken away from you the curse and the reviling wherewith you have dishonored him. He neither imputes nor punishes, but has bestowed upon you such rich grace and blessing while ye were only worthy of malediction. Inasmuch as ye reviled God without intermission, for where there is unbelief, the heart must ever curse God. Do ye also, as has been done toward you, curse not, rail not, do well, speak well, even though you are treated ill, and endure it where you are unrighteously used. We, we talked about it in our catechism question this week. A true sense of sin. A genuine recognition of sin. The fact that we are repenting, that true repentance is a genuine recognition of sin. And when we face someone else's sin, we must also be reminded of our own insincerity. And because they lack a true sense of sin, does not give us permission, as those that do recognize, to act in an unjust manner toward them. Rather, we say, as I said last week, there but for the grace of God go I. Martin Luther touched on a very true fact. We reviled God without intermission, nonstop. Why? Because where there is unbelief, while you are an unbeliever, your heart must ever curse God. All the years we spent not being in Christ, our heart hated God, reviled God. 
hated the things of God. As Peter has said, what is part of our proclamation? Once we were not a people, now we are a people. Once we had no mercy, now we have mercy. The fact of the matter is that representing Christ when everything is just fine, when everything is going well, and we're facing minimal hardship and minimal difficulties is rather simple. Bear in mind, this is Peter writing this. The same man that in the safety of the upper room says, I'll die for you, Jesus. To the end, Jesus. Everyone else is going to betray all these guys. Forget about these guys. They're all weak sauce. I'm your man. I can do it. And he was the one that denied thrice. This is the same man that's saying, you got to endure. You can do this. It's not easy when everything is going well. It's in the middle of adversity, in the middle of trials, in the midst of personal hardships to our faith that, that, that our faith is truly demonstrated. Just as the beauty of a precious stone is easier to see against a black backdrop, the beauty of Christian character is seen most clearly when we respond to the hard and ugly things in life in a manner which glorifies God. And the Lord in His sovereignty chose as the instrument for these words the same man who rejected Him three times, the same man who was reconciled to the Lord, the same man whose instructions were, Feed my sheep. It is He that writes, You don't respond like they do. You're a Christian. You've been redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Have a worldly government and a human institution? There's a biblical model of submission to be followed. Have a worldly boss? Or in the case here, have a, a worldly master? There's a biblical standard and model of submission to adhere, to adhere to. Have a worldly spouse? There's a biblically appropriate approach to submission in order to win them to Christ. And here, finally, he's saying, you're the church. Are you the church? There's a biblical expectation for how you act in Christian love, having a unity of mind, Christian sympathy, brotherly and familial love shown in tender heartedness and humility of mind toward one another as a church. And as you strive to display these characteristics of biblical love and submission toward one another, in the gathered body of believers, your witness to the world is to be counter-cultural. You basically stop and think, well, I've forgiven so-and-so so many times because the Word of God has called me so within the body. I can surely forgive this person. Or the Lord forgives me daily, numerous times of so many transgressions. Surely, I can forgive this person. Doesn't mean you're not going to feel the upsetness. Doesn't mean that you're not going to feel the sting and the hurt of the wrong. Doesn't mean you don't feel the sting of the slap that comes against your cheek or the pain of loss. A body of believers who practices the characteristics of love, unity of mind, sympathy, tender heartedness, and humility toward one another will naturally be able to to respond toward the unbeliever in a more gracious and Christ-exalting way. We stop and we think of Stephen and his response. He's literally dying. I, I honestly and, and in sincerity cannot even imagine the, the, the pain of being pelted by various rocks, the, the sharp pains that he's going through. And he doesn't die screaming, Curse you all! He doesn't die going, you'll all burn in hell. Rather, our brother Stephen dies saying, forgive them, Lord. Forgive them. It requires a serious level of sanctification, effort, discipline, for us to respond 
to the evils of this world with the grace that God has called us to. As is, in order for us to practice these wonderful Christian principles with one another, it requires a lot from us, a lot of dedication, a lot of maturity, trial, difficulty, because the fact of the matter is, even within the body, we struggle to demonstrate these wonderful Christian at attributes. We, we don't often forgive the slight of our brothers and sisters in Christ. I remember one of the first things I learned when I became a deacon in the church in, in Juarez was there will be brothers and sisters that will take offense because you forgot to shake their hand. And that was a horrible thing for me to hear because you, you have any idea how forgetful I can be when my mind is running and I'm thinking about a million different things? There are times that I forget what my wife was just trying to tell me because my mind is in a million other places. Praise the Lord that my wife is gracious enough to forget. I'm sorry, what was that? And it is a genuine, I'm sorry. But that was one of the first things I learned and I came to experience that. Because I had duties, I had to set this up, or I had to set the microphones up, or I had to fix this or fix that. I've got a whole wonton of random things, and I'm trying to say, hello, God bless you, welcome to as many people as I can manage to catch in my mind. And there were several times that I didn't get to say to this family, or to this family, or to this brother, or to this widow, God bless you, how are you? And at the end of the service, I got a dirty look as they walked away from me and didn't shake my hand because I'd stand at the door to, to greet everyone on their way out. Think about it. We struggle sometimes with sincerity to display the, the, the fruit of the Spirit and the same Christian characteristics toward one another. But as I said, these are the training grounds. This is where we, we slowly become better conditioned as the Christian soldiers to go out and face the world. Once you've forgiven Bob for the past 55 times he sat in your spot, or once you've forgiven Betsy for always grabbing your bulletin before you can get to it, or once you've forgiven so-and-so for always caking on the cologne or the perfume, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, it gets just that little bit easier to forgive the people that really do not know. We stop and we think of the context of Stephen's words. Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. What was, what was Stephen talking about when he said that? Have you guys ever meditated on that and thought of what that meant? They knew they were killing him. And they knew why they thought they were killing him. They thought they were killing him for blasphemy. And yet Christ had already said to his disciples, They'll kill you. And they're going to kill you thinking they're doing God a service. And so when he's dying and he says, forgive them, they know not what they do. He is speaking about their ignorance as regards God. And that's just it. When we go out and we are facing reviling and hatred, we are being hated upon by blind people being led by the blind. We are being hated upon by those that have literally zero illumination as regards the truth that has been revealed to us by God's grace. Therefore, we forge our Christian character in what's supposed to be the easiest of environments among believers so that when we go out into the world, when we go out and by our character and our life and our words and our disposition, faithfully represent Christ, we can demonstrate a Christ-like character that glorifies God. Just as Christ himself did, setting the example. And so we now get to verse 10. But before we get to verse 10, it's a quotation of Psalm 34, verses 1 through 16. Now, we've talked about why it is that Christ said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
And if you remember, the reason, as I explained, why Christ did that was so that the people that were there would look to their hymnal, the Psalms. So they would see the unfolding of these events, the fulfillment of these events before their eyes. And so when Peter quotes Psalm 34, verses, verses 10 through 12, or sorry, 12 through 16, it's not just Peter grounding his argument in Scripture. That is certainly a part of it, absolutely. But like Christ, we are to look at the psalm and see, okay, what does it look like to endure this hardship and this reviling? What does it look like? What is the good life? What do good days and loving life look like when you're facing this kind of thing? Psalm 34, verses 1 through 16, I will bless the Lord when? At all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes his boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who does what? Takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him have no lack the young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. This is a good life. We're seeing what the good life is. We're seeing how you love life, and it's not what the world says. Those who fear the Lord. Come, O oh children, listen to me. I will teach you to fear the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days? that he may see good. So again, what are we talking about here? What is the verse right before what we are talking about, what Peter is addressing, saying, fear the Lord. What is our motivation for submission? The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And it is not a type of fear of someone who is a tyrant and is out to destroy you. It is a familial fear. It is a fear of wanting to not disappoint your loving Father. And so, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? If that's you, keep your tongue from evil, your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, his ears toward their cry, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. This is all a part of our meditation as we get into verses 10 through 12. A mind and a heart of belief, of faithfulness, of recognition that God is always going to provide. Even in the middle of difficulties, even in the middle of all of the trials and tribulations that are coming your way. We think of the psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. God's provision, even in the midst of your enemies, is a central reality to those that are God's. Whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceit. But the question arises, what is the good life? What determines whether we've had a good day? What is a good day? Is it wealth? Prosperity? Good looks? Fame? Sex? Drugs? Property? Cars? Is it houses? Is it when things go our way? When nothing bad has happened to us? When we're not sick? When things are going in the right direction, right in quotes, 
How do we define the good life? Because the fact of the matter is there's a lot of sad Christians out there. There are a lot of Christians who don't love life because they're busy trying to love other things which they believe will bring them good days. The people of this world would say yes to some of these things. And their pursuit of these things, life, wealth, health, financial and physical prosperity, borders on idolatry. But relevant to us is the fact that there are even those who take the title of Christian who seek after what John called the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life in 1 John 2.16. And there are others who are so lost, so lost that they claim that everything is subject only to personal interpretation. That's to say, a good day is one thing to one person and a different thing to another. The world would say, well, a different day, a good day is really different depending on where you are. A good day to a farmer is getting some rain. And a good day to a person in the middle of the city is not going to be that same rain. That's not what it is. As usual, a Christian must see to it that Scripture alone is what informs our perception of what is right, what is good, what is pleasant in this life. How do you love life? According to what Scripture says. What is good? What Scripture says is good. Not what the world does. It is not subjective. This truth is not a subjective truth. A good day is not a matter of personal interpretation. Scripture alone must determine what good days and loving life mean. Dr. MacArthur comments on this saying, we're all familiar, I think, with those in our society who seek the sweet life, who seek the good life. But, what, but how about those in another society? We can find it even in the pages of Holy Scripture, can't we? You remember the man in the Old Testament who pursued the good life in all the wrong places? His name was Solomon. Solomon had incredible wealth. He had houses, had chariots, had horses, had women, had sex, had land. He had power. He had fame. He had everything that people today would say the good life must contain. Even the queen of Sheba, who was no commoner herself, came to visit him and was so staggered at his wealth and so staggered at his immense power, so staggered at his person as his possession that in Scripture it says in 2 Chronicles 9.4 that she was breathless. It literally took her breath away to see what he had. But was he content? Did he love life? Did he really see good days? Did he really experience living to the fullest? Listen to his words. Solomon in Ecclesiastes 2.17 says, So I hated life. That's tragic. I hated life because everything is futility and a striving after wind. I guess at the core of this, we have to stop and think, what is the ultimate good? And that's not just a philosophical question. It is a question that is absolutely central to the Christian life. What is the ultimate good for us? What do we see as the ultimate source of good, we sing, Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy praise. That is a reality. He is the fountain of every blessing. He is the fountain of everything that is good. And we need Him to tune our hearts, to attune us, that we may see that goodness in Him, that we might come to see Him more and more as the pearl of great price, as the one of supreme and ultimate value. The good life is a life lived out in obedience to God. Once you see that Christ is the ultimate good, then pleasing the one who is the ultimate good is what determines what is good. Because He said Himself, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. 
Those were Jesus' words. And Scripture heralds and proclaims the truth that our joy and our strength and goodness is to be found in this life and none other than in Christ Jesus himself. Charles Spurgeon said, If I lost everything in this world but had Christ, I have everything. The poorest person in any part of the world who has Christ has the good life. And a good day or our love of life, your loving your life should not be contingent upon material possessions. It should not be contingent upon the lust of the eyes. There are way too many people, men and women, who basically herald what that one lady said in her song. I am living in a material world and I am a material male or female, depending on who's saying it, right? But that's what it is. Materialism. Get stuff and get as much of it As you can. People lose themselves in the pursuit of what they believe is going to fill the void and make them happy. And it does not do it. Already, we know better. We have been called to better. And we recognize that the good life, as Scripture tells us, comes from loving and fearing God and walking in obedience to Him. So as such, we practice the good life when we firstly keep ourselves from speaking evil and stop our lips from speaking deceitfully. This is not something new. Peter's already talked about this in the last chapter. We are to put away all manner of deceit from our lives. And Scripture tells us, that we will be held accountable for every word we speak before the Lord, before God, on that final day in judgment. Our Lord Jesus said, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give account for every thoughtless word they speak. I shudder, really, when I stop and think about that sometimes. Because I will. I'll have to give account for every thought, And for every thoughtless word I've spoken, every thoughtless word I've spoken to my wife, every thoughtless word I've spoken to anyone, I'll have to stand before my Lord, my Savior, my Redeemer, the one who dragged this dead man and gave him life, who forgave all the sins that I have had, and say, "Mm, Lord, I definitely didn't represent you there. I, I just imagine it. Here's a playback. You hear what you just said? How could you say that considering how much I've forgiven you? I I shudder at that reality. And yet at the same time I rejoice that the salvation I have is in Christ alone. I, I will absolutely have to give accounts for it. And there will be no escaping it. Not just because I preached it, but because the whole word of God heralds this reality. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. We are to watch what we say, how we say it. And here, Peter goes further and deeper, explaining that we are not just to put away all manner of deceitfulness as a manner or as a part of our spiritual maturity and sanctification, but rather are putting away of all deceitfulness, extends as it well should to our speech. We put away hatred and we put away hatred from every element of our lives. We put away that hatred from our minds. We put away that hatred from our lips. Have you ever come to see a repentant racist? I have. On, on every part. I'm not just talking about a white brother or sister who has repented from racism. I'm talking about an African brother and sister, a Mexican brother and sister who have repented of their hatred of everybody else. 
And it is a putting away of those evils from their minds and from their mouths. They stop the hatred that is sinful as regards pointed to a specific person based off of skin color. And they stop themselves from speaking that evil as well. But Peter calls us to put away deceitfulness. We're not out to lie. And when we represent God, we're not representing God in this world. Context. When we forgive and when we bless, it's not supposed to be fake. We're not out to deceive people and say, Oh, thank you for breaking my headlight and busting my tire. And for the several thousand dollars of damages that you've given, it's not a fake posturing. It is rather a sincere one. Put away all deceitfulness. I, I am not going to lie to you and tell you I'm happy about this. But I'll tell you right now, I am praying for your salvation. Obviously you hate me. I can see that. You speak evil to me. Your actions show hatred. I won't respond the same way. I'm not happy about it. But I've been redeemed. And I'm going to pray for your salvation. You put away deceitfulness from your tongue, from your speaking. Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. And Peter grounds this argument in the scriptures. He's basically saying this is the way to love life and have good days. And it's found in the word of God. Keep your tongue from evil and keep your lips from spewing forth deceit. When you're interacting with people, be genuine. Be real. Be a true Christian. Don't be fake about it. Don't try to win them deceitfully. Be, be frank about it. And that begins with bridling the tongue. You keep your tongue from evil. So that means that when you talk to family members who are worldly about the person that just busted up your vehicle or went and destroyed your lawn or whatever it may be, you do not participate in the scorn and the vitriol and the poison that they are going to say when you report what has happened. You represent Christ. It's done. Either one of two things is going to happen. I mean, the cops are going to take care of everything they can on there and here and now. But either they'll come to faith, as I will pray that they do, as the Lord calls me to do, or they will burn eternally because they never did come to faith. Either way, my responsibility is to be faithful to God. And I'm not going to speak evil of that person. I'm not happy about what they did. I'm not happy about the scorn and the poison and the horrible things that they say. I can't expect that we be fake. And say, oh, please, call me an ignorant blah, blah, blah once again. Call me a bigot once again. Call me these names and tell me I'm a fool and a moron and, and stupid and uneducated for believing that God created everything in six days. No, of course not. And that's exactly what Peter's saying. Don't be deceitful. Put away evil. It is evil to lie when you're engaging with people. Now understand, there, there's that double area. We are not to be deceitful with one another. We've already seen that earlier. And we're not going to be deceitful when engaging with the people of this world. When they revile, we don't revile. When they are evil, we're not responding with evil. And that response of non-reviling and of non-evil extends to our speech. And he continues, let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. And that is where we will pick up. We will get through 11 and 12 next week. I can assure you. We will, we will get through 11 and 12. But we'll pick up in verse 11 next week. We close with the words of Paul in Romans 15 verses 5 through 6. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the Lord, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said, Amen.